Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Skubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Skubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. And I'm excited today we have Brandon Checkets. He's co-founder of Seller Labs with Paul Johnson. They make awesome tools for e-commerce sellers, including Feedback Genius, Snagshout, and Scope, which he will talk about and what they do and how they help sellers. He also founded Bookscouter.com that's responsible for tens of millions of dollars of book buyback sales annually. Brandon, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Jeremy. It's great to be here. I'm excited, and I love the burly beard. It's a little intimidating, but that's cool. Um, and so, you know, there's so many things I made notes of that we should talk about um, because you have a really uh, a group of huge team of real developers working on real problems to help e-commerce sellers. So I want to dig into that. But first, I need to hear about some of the big takeaways of how you increase sales from Book Scouter because you started from zero and it's grown tremendously. Yeah, Book Scouter, I guess, uh, is a combination of good timing and uh, good uh, SEO, good product at the right time. Um, so that was started clear back in around 2007, uh, which uh, my wife actually had a friend who was blogging about uh, how she was trying to get out of debt and she was selling some of her old college textbooks mm. in order to pay off her, her student loans and bills. And so uh, I had a, a, a little bit of background in, in writing something similar to that. And so I threw together a thing over a weekend or two that allowed her to compare prices from, I think it was five or seven sites at the, at the time. Uh, and she wrote about it on her blog and it kind of spread nicely. Uh, I was able to keep growing that and the timing was just right where people found that it was really, really easy to sell inventory and it really became difficult to acquire and buy inventory. Mm. So it was a, a good timing in, the, in respect that uh, like people needed to acquire inventory and there was a lot of these new sites that were launching that were offering to buy books. And so the price comparison we did on Bookscatter with became really valuable and has done really well. So yeah. So from an e-commerce standpoint, what should people be doing now that you did or used in when you created Bookscatter? What should people be doing now that I did? Yeah. Well, I mean, tactics have changed a little bit, but uh, I mean, I I, I paid a, a lot of time. I spent a, a fair amount of attention on SEO, like and site performance, to make sure the site ran really well. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, looking back at the old design, it was incredibly simplistic. I think I had a total of seven images on the site in order mm. to make it look fast. Yeah, and so it was really just optimized for like Google. Really, that was uh, at the time where Google started to place some emphasis on page speed and uh, user experience, and so that I think helped uh, when we were trying to gain traction and, and and actually do better than our competitors as well. So yeah, um, because you you kind of are very modest you said you know i did a couple things in the past like this but when i was looking at your background it says like maintained over 400 unix based servers 20 you know you had this really technical background um to create this so you know as far as book scouter goes you you also had a warehouse too right i've done a lot of things so my my career really started in as being a uh, system. I really started when I was like 16 or whatever, like fixing computers in a computer store. Right. Sort of evolved into working at. Uh, uh, it was Flying J at the time, the truck stop company. We I worked in their their uh, help desks where we were maintaining their printers and their computers and their registers and even the pumps. Some of the hardware that would run out on the card readers on the pumps and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that sort of uh, led me from doing the support for that into doing some programming. So from the system administration started, I started to do some development and programming in order to make our tasks there a little bit simpler. And then from there, it's really been more and more about development and actually writing code that uh, does interesting things and pulling together separate systems and data from here and data from there to do something that hasn't been done before. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I wanna talk about some of those days, but what's interesting is, you know, from an e-commerce to, you know, a software company, you see a lot of trends, you know, in the industry. Um, what are some, and obviously you created some of these softwares to fill a need, and you have a really cool infographic. People can check it out on sellerlabs.com backslash about. But <clears throat> tell me about the 2010. You and, and Paul were selling stuff together online. What did that look like? 
So essentially, with that came, that's, that sort of came out of Book Scouter. So yeah. Book Scouter was uh, starting to do well, um, uh, and I figured that people were using Book Scouter in order to buy and resell books to make money. So I should probably use my own tool to <laughs> make some money, right? Exactly. Um, so Paul knew of a place in Atlanta. It was actually the Atlanta. It's called the Mail Recovery Center, where the USPS takes all the things that are lost in the mail, and they sell them off there in by the pallet or by the really, some, really for the most part oh, wow. by the pallet. Uh, I had a fair amount of experience with books, so I bought, I think the first time there I was somewhat intimidated by the auction and how expensive things were, but our second time there I bought a pallet of books for, I think it was like $4,000. How uh, many books comes in like a pallet of books? Like what? What is so, that? It's been a while since I actually did the math on this, but as I recall, it's about 900 pounds in a pallet. It's basically one big, they call it a Gaylord. It's a big brown box. It's the size of a pallet and about three feet tall. Wow. And it has about 900, 800 to 1,000 pounds of books in it. And each pound, each book's around a pound. So you might say it's wow. 700, 800 to 900 books in yeah. there. I, I'd be scared too. You buy this pallet for 4,000. You have no idea what's in it, right? No idea what's in there other than, you know, there's 40 other people that bought a pallet of books for about the same price. So <laughs> they think it's worth about that. So <laughs> Social I, proof. Social right. proof. If I've got some knowledge about books that I think these guys don't have, maybe I can do about what they're doing or, you know. It's somewhat of a risk, but we, we did that. We did fairly well that first pallet we bought from there. Um, yeah, so when you, what is the opening process? Like, what did you actually find? What was in the pallet? Oh, uh, well, they have it somewhat sorted out. It's actually really fun if you ever have a chance. It's actually, the auctions used to be live at the, at the auction at the government, the USPS facility in yeah. Atlanta. And they're now done online at govdeals.com. Hmm. Um, so you can actually go through and browse those. Look That's really stuff, cool. The Mail Recovery Center. So do they have any they have stuff besides books? Like do they have, well, they have tons of stuff? The books are well sorted out because it's pretty easy to know how to book. Yeah, they have electronics. They've got Legos. They've got any this kind is, of household. This is amazing. I Anything never knew about this. Be shipped can be lost. So right. They actually had uh, gold jewelry. Bars of gold would be sold and lost. Wow. Uh, all kinds of jewelry. All everything you can imagine was for sale there. That's so, crazy. Actually, we can uh, stop the interview now, Brandon. That was interesting enough. Let's, it's done. Go I, think, I think they have an auction every two weeks now, I believe. Um, and so there's usually one going. If there's not one, it'll be up in a week or so. Right. So um, you unwrap this book. So tell me about the process of actually selling selling all these books. So a lot of the, the, the very first time we were doing this was uh, I actually, I did it out of my garage for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, found out that was somewhat successful. I rented a storage unit, like a 200 square foot storage unit. Mm -hmm. um, we got, we buy the pallets of stuff at a at the auction. We'd get a, a box truck that would we'd rent and deliver four or five pallets back to our warehouse. Mm -hmm. Had a just a, de a laptop computer with a barcode scanner set up in there. And then I, I wrote some custom software that was sort of based on book scatter that would take the Amazon, it would take all the book scatter prices since I had pretty ready access to those. It would then like look up a lot of the information from the Amazon's APIs. Mm. And it would make a decision and say, it's probably better for you to sell us on Amazon or it's better to sell us to the book scatter vendor. Oh, really? And so for a long time, we were just saying, okay, we found probably 10 to 15% of the stuff would go to a book scatter vendor. And those would go in a pile. At the end of the day, we'd box those up and ship them off. And then 80% of the stuff would be more worth worth more on Amazon. And so this was at a time before they had FBA storage limits. Mm. So we just put those in another process and put an FBA sticker on it and put it in a box to go to Amazon uh, to FBA. And all that stuff would go to FBA at the time, and so we basically had, we were able to run uh, a decent sized you know book selling operation there out of a 200 square foot storage unit uh, by shipping everything to FBA. So wow. that's, that's the early days. Did you ramp it up though, the storage unit or the the facility? We did. So we actually had I think 17,000 books at FBA at the time, and wow. then Am we got that nasty email from Amazon that says we're we're introducing Amazon FBA storage limits, and you're only allowed to have 10,000 items. At FBA, so we've got. I think by that time we had a couple storage units, but we've got you know thousands and thousands of books in here that we can no longer send to FBA. And we made a decision at that time to go ahead and pursue it. And we we, we found a four thousand square foot. Uh, it was really a old vet veterinarian's office that we turned into a makeshift warehouse. Wow. That we started build putting in the shelves there and all that kind of stuff in order to warehouse and fulfill those things ourselves. So yeah, so I want to hear about this because obviously you are not. At the time, we're not an expert at warehouse management. And uh -huh. so what did you find? What systems did you find work for people out there who are listening who may be ramping up their, their storage facility or maybe just want some insights in how it should work? 
Well, the technology that we had available at the time is nothing like it's available now. So right. back then, I think Monsoon was probably the biggest, specifically for books. Mm -hmm. Monsoon did a lot of stuff. There was a lot of stuff about it we didn't like, uh, a lot of stuff that we wanted to build into it. Uh, it. Specifically, like FBA was brand new and like Monsoon didn't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. That was a critical part of our business. So um, we looked at probably a three or four other vendors to try and find something that would do what we want, but we didn't find anything that did what we want. And we figured, you know, how hard can it be to put stuff on a shelf and find it again? So <laughs> <laughs> we just started, we started building that, uh, that software ourselves to be able to, be, we, every, Every book essentially had a barcode on it. Every shelf had a barcode, and right. we just scan stuff when we scan the book, scan the barcode, and we'd know where it was when we had to find it. So. And you still run, you still own Book Scouter, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because if on. you if you look on the, someone looks on the homepage, it's just like search an ISBN number, and you just easily search it. Yeah. Yeah. What, what did the first stuff. version look like? This is a really clean, good version. Did, did it always look like this? No, you can go back on archive.org and see what it looked like. It started off with this sort of blue and white checkerboard-looking pattern, and <laughs> it was ugly. And then the next version was a big white screen with a logo at the top um, and a menu bar, and that's about it. And I think about two years ago, we launched the current version. So so how did you meet Paul? So I met Paul originally when we started buying books. Uh, I met him uh, through a church group here. Um, he's uh, met him through there, became friends. I was impressed with Paul because... He was a guy that could just get stuff done. He didn't like. He actually started. He was running a guitar store at the time. He was running Discount Discount Guitar Warehouse, hmm. um, and so he was selling guitars on on his own website and then on eBay. Yeah, uh, we started doing the book thing together. We found some other opportunities at the auction. We started buying some used electronics, uh, batteries, like essentially. I think that they called them at the time as it was cords and uh, modems and remote controls is what mm -hmm. they were selling. Mm -hmm. And it was basically a big, huge t tangle of cords and batteries and remote controls all thrown into a big, you can imagine a big. Uh, you know, I big, think I have one in my closet. It looks like Yeah, that. one of these big, huge tubs. It probably weighs about 200 pounds when it's put on a pallet, all fold, folded up or just filled with cords and all this stuff tangled together. And we found we could actually buy those for like 200 bucks because nobody wanted to deal with them. But then we, we bought one or two of them and we found like it had all these, uh, I think they were uh, Xbox power supplies in them. Mm-hmm. So we'd find the 20 or 30 Xbox power supplies in there that were worth 40, 50, I can't remember, 60 oh, bucks really? at a time. Wow. So we'd pay $200 for this pallet and we'd pull out all the Xbox power supplies and sell those and make a good profit and then go recycle all the copper out of the, all the other stuff and <laughs> it's come out pretty well. So. so what were you doing at the time? Were you still doing coding and technical stuff? or? So I was writing a lot of the software and trying to like make the system work. Yeah. And then I was hiring people to actually do a lot of the actually – you know, pick, picking stuff out of a bin, scan it, putting on a shelf. Um, I, I did a lot of stuff. I, I had another uh, sort of thing we started at the time that was possible at the time to try and like watch Amazon inventory levels and some other interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so doing a lot, mostly still development at the time, and then still trying to like work with Paul. Uh, Paul had different needs as far as like the inventory that he was getting. Most of that stuff wasn't suitable for Amazon, so we were writing connectors for eBay to do that kind of stuff. Uh, we were using, I think it was Inkfrog at the time to, to list a lot of that. and then, But he still had this problem of Inkfrog, didn't do inventory locations. So we had to still use the inventory management piece that we'd written for book, Scott, or for the book business. So yeah. it was hacking together all these different systems to try right. to make it up. So. so Brandon, at what point were you like, okay, I want to develop, now you have Book Scouter. At what point did you say, okay, I want to develop a software more for just everyone who's doing e-commerce? I'd say it probably came when we started going to trade shows on behalf of Book Scouter. So we went to, there was particularly the, uh, the show in Seattle, the Seattle Conference for Online Entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. COP. We went to that back in, I don't know what year it was, probably five years ago, as Book Scouter because we've historically been a lot of booksellers there. Yeah. Um, and we'd gone there one or two years as Book Scouter, but started looking around, looking for inventory management type of stuff for our new book business that we were trying to do in our, in our liquidation business. And not finding any really good solutions there and kind of deciding, like, oh, our stuff actually is a little more compelling in ways than these are. Mm -hmm. And so we put a little bit more, more effort into making the stuff that was highly, it was highly specific to our business and our environment. A lot of stuff had been hard-coded for our pricing rules and whatever. Started to generalize that a little bit more and make it more generally available so a user can subscribe to it and sign up for it and whatever. 
And so I guess the, 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 the real genesis of that was just looking, going around at a trade show and deciding like our stuff with a little bit of work, our stuff could be competitive with what's already out there. So, you know, at what point do you decide I am not going to go to any more pal by any more pallets of books and just focus on software? That, that really came after, uh, just realizing the opportunities available in software, I suppose. So yeah. with an inventory-based business, the, the amount of money that you can make is really dependent on the, on the amount of money in the business. Yeah. And so if you have X number of dollars in the bank or in, available in the business, you can make as profit some percentage of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's kind of the, the inverse is more true with software. Is like if you, uh, um, you know, you, you, you put a large capital investment up front to develop software and support, but... Uh, the, the potential for the, that is the infrastructure is there. Yeah, there's much bigger upside. So um, that's kind of why we switched over. And the first product for Seller Labs was Feedback Genius. That's right. So actually, we were in the middle of writing all this inventory management stuff uh, between me and Paul and our, our, our warehouse that we were trying to run. Uh, Paul went on a vacation to the beach one weekend, and I figured I was going to hack together this idea I'd thought up a while back to try and pull in all the Amazon order information from uh, Amazon. And then cross-reference that with shipping provider data from UPS and USPS and FedEx. Right. Try and send a message to my customers like on the day it was delivered. That was okay. nobody was doing that yet. Uh, and what then we made have, you think of that? Why? Why did you want to do that? Um, the main reason for that was to the, make our feedback score get better. So yeah. we were a, a relatively small bookseller in the marketplace, and we wanted to be more competitive and get better buy box placement. So yeah, yeah more feedback we were at one of those things where you know we're at 96 97 percent if we had 98 or 99 percent maybe we'd sell more yeah so that was one of the original reasons for it the other thing that we found was we actually one of the things we were buying at the usps auction was these they called them loose mixed media and it was essentially dvds you can think of like netflix discs that were lost yeah just the disc no artwork no case for it uh, we buy you know 200 pound box of these things at a time that had 5,000 discs in it what? And we'd be, you know, identifying those, trying to ship them off. But so wait, you know, let me ask you about this. So there's no identifying information on the outside of it. You'd have the, the cover of the disc, but there was nothing that would say. I mean, you know, obviously some movies are a lot like uh, the majority of stuff actually says the name of the movie on it. Okay. The name, see the name of the artist on the wow. The seat. Okay. Yeah. It wouldn't have the case or the uh, artwork that comes with it. Gotcha. Just blank, just discs, right? <laughs> there were a lot, a bit plastic. There was fairly heavy plastic. And so we'd create listings for these. We'd put them in a we put them in a case. We'd sell that. We put the listing up on Amazon and say that you know this item is for the disc in a generic case only. It doesn't include the artwork. But we found we'd have a lot of complaints from those. We'd ship them out to people, and people would leave us negative feedback because it didn't contain the artwork. And so even though our listing said that, we found like Amazon isn't wasn't really good at conveying that information. Right, right. It wasn't always available on Amazon. So one of the other reasons we wrote Feedback Genius was to send mes messages specifically for those those particular SKUs. Uh, and we wanted to message the customer as soon as the order was placed, as soon as we possibly could, and mention to the, to the buyer that this item does not contain the artwork or the uh, or the original case. So right. if that's not what you were expecting, please cancel it right now before we ship it to you, because after we ship it to you, you know, you're not going to get it back. Right. And so that was the other, sort of the two main cases for why Feedback Genius was launched initially and why we kind of had that initial feature set. Yeah, so you that initial feature set, and then you're thinking, at what point do you think, well, other people are going to want this, I'm going to try and release this to others? Uh, so I, I, probably, I, I think, if I recall right, I built a really primitive, hard-coded version of that in a, in a week or two and actually found that it worked. You know, We actually had fewer people uh, buying or returning or complaining about the, the defective discs. Mm-hmm. And found that our feedback was a percentage of the number of items we shipped. We were getting more feedback for it, so mm -hmm. I was like, "Well, this actually works. I think there's value to that. Let's let's put a little bit of time into it and make a nice page for somebody to sign up and be able to customize this stuff." So, yeah, it didn't take us long to like. But that, that time, I had an inclination of that's where it was going to go. Yeah. And so it didn't take a whole lot of time to like make that hard coded version work in a more general purpose for other yeah. people. Yeah, and I know I want to talk about. Um, scope at one point. Right now you're in beta, and when this comes out, you probably people will be able to get it. But what did the beta look like in Feedback Genius? Um, it actually looked. Uh, I would say it looked uglier than it does now. Yeah. Uh, we hired a designer later. Uh, you know, while we were developing that, yeah. that actually made it look a little bit better. Um, so it, 
it looks it actually probably looked really similar to what's on there now after we got that first mm -hmm. uh, scan change so it looked decent so yeah how do you release it how do you get the word out um i started initially i think i ran an ad on book scatter so i had book scatter oh, gotcha. a number of people using that so i think i started initially with some people and some contacts i had there just put an advertisement on the side of that and it grew really fairly organically from just being a part of uh, a couple of uh, mailing lists uh, a few things like that going to the trade show we actually went to the trade show the next year as as uh, seller labs and Got people to use it from there. Got a couple of, you know, just people talking about it and word spreads fairly quickly. Yeah. So what's best practice for feedback, you know, using Feedback Genius or staying in touch with your customers that you probably learn from using this software? Uh, I would say that, uh, you know. Because there's customer... a lot of features. There's not just uh, an email, but you can customize different messages. There, there's different uh, features of the the software itself. So yeah, we actually find we might have named it the wrong thing because it's not just about feedback anymore. Right. It's more about just po proactive customer communication. It's yeah, a flexible messaging tool. So um, you can use it in any number of ways. Uh, we've got people that, for example, that just that, that just use it to send an attachment to the buyer. Maybe they have a, a product that has uh, some complicated instructions or a, a common misuse or a common complaint about it, and they can send some messaging with feedback units just to set the expectations for how yeah. this is supposed to work or whatever. Um, you know, people obviously use it for feedback and for product reviews fairly extensively. It very, does very good at that. And then since you can customize it based on what product the, per the person bought, you can customize that message content to really target on, on the specific product that they bought. Mm -hmm. um, and then make it, the other thing we find is very successful is to make it sound like you're a person and not just some corporation asking for feedback. I give some personality to it. And, some humor or something yeah. to make it out a little bit. What have you found works best? Depends on your brand. You know, if you're selling, if you're selling a very serious product, that's, uh, you know, if you're selling medical gloves to a, a hospital, maybe a different tone comes through. <laughs> than if you're selling, uh, like, yeah, I'm not even going to say a joke for that, but yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> if you're, if you're selling, uh, we had and people have sold all kinds of things. So somebody, I remember a lady talked to us, she was selling, um, what are the thing cheerleaders throw up in the, in the air? The pom poms. Yeah, the, the brand for that sounds drastically different than does a brand for a, a medical device or something. So you can, you can communicate your brand through there, both through like an image, through logos and stuff like that, as well yeah. as the... Yeah. The, so what are other mistakes people make, Brandon, with communicating with their customers? Uh, I would say we see a lot of people that try to encourage, I think, too much communication. Like as, as an Amazon shopper, if I go onto Amazon and I buy a cell phone case for seven bucks... I don't expect to get six emails about that. I would like <laughs> there to be one about that, Do right? people send six emails? Uh, I think we've seen people as send as many as six or seven, but yeah. Uh, so I would encourage you to send something that's appropriate, <laughs> right? So in most cases, that's probably one or two messages. One or, or two. One or two, I would say, for most cases. Okay. In, in general, I'd say like less expensive stuff, under, under $10, under $15, it should probably be one. Uh, more expensive. If you're selling something for two or three hundred dollars, you can probably uh, give some more instructions, some more um, some more messaging around that as well. So yeah. that's one one component out of many that you might use the, the price of the item. Yeah, because I could see people, you know, some people take it to the extreme and like abuse abuse it, like. Yeah, I mean, we certainly don't want to see that. And there's there's tools besides feedback genius out there, and they hurt. All of us as a whole, if you over message your customers, like it's, right. it's we don't want to see. So, trying to encourage people to be somewhat realistic about what if if you're an Amazon shopper, like how many emails would you like to receive about this? Right. Put yourself in their shoes. Yeah, probably not more than one or two for right. most people. So right. Maybe so, three cases. Again, you see a lot of different businesses. What are some other cool stuff that you see people selling online that are using your services? Like you said, the pom poms. What else? That's the, oh, I don't know. I, I've seen everything you can possibly imagine people selling. Like, uh, I I probably can't name any specifics because there are customers right. and data, but there's everything from. Obviously, there's still a lot of people that sell books and DVDs and that kind of stuff, but lots of kitchen gadgets, lots of, uh, you know, pet supplies, all kinds of things. Any popular trends you're seeing lately that that are working well? As far as products, I don't I yeah. don't dig into stuff enough to know what products are popular. I guess or what what specific things people are selling. So so Feedback Genius, you release it, people are using it. What was the next product 
a software product. It's kind of funny because even though we were, we released Feedback Genius, I think it was uh, April 2013 or so. I'd have to yeah. go back and look and see. But we released that. Uh, started April charging. 2013, yeah. Yeah, we started charging for it, I think, uh, in August or so. Yeah. Um, and all this whole time, though, we're still working on our inventory management system, trying to make sure, you know, make sure we figure we've got some, some pretty good there. So we actually spent the next year or so, like, still writing feedback or still writing inventory management software. Uh, we kind of got to a point where we thought it was ready to go and then tried to sign up some people on it and found like it was way too complicated. And they only wanted this feature and that feature, but not that feature. And then trying to get people to change their whole business, like, the inventory management is something is a, is, a, is a software project that people use all day, every day. Right. So they had very kind of specific ways in which they wanted to use it. And yeah. so we, what, what we had didn't meet all those needs, and it was hard to go in and modify. Right. So we went back and basically scrapped it and started over with an API sort of API first approach so that we could do it in a more modular way. Um, but then feedback units just took off. So we, yeah. We, we kind of abandoned the inventory management piece of that and still use some of that API stuff that we wrote on our back end in order to pull data in from Amazon, but we don't do any of the inventory management yeah. stuff anymore. So. You and founder of Scubana should uh, trade war stories at some point, probably. That's probably why they went to the all-in-one e-commerce, because it probably doesn't work any other way yeah. unless you include everything in there. Yeah, I've talked to Chad a little bit. Yeah. Right? how some of that stuff works and he's you know when he describes some of the stuff they're doing I'm like yeah that's a good way of doing it that's probably how i would do it if i was again <laughs> so um so feedback genius took off um but you're not one to to sit on your laurels right you're you're always creating so what was the next thing you created so was it snag shout um, yeah i think you know like i said we spent a, a fair amount of time doing inventory management uh we actually this, at the same time we started hiring other people just for developers and for customer support people. So a lot of stuff was internal, trying to get that, that stuff off the ground. Um, but then uh, I remember I sent an email to Paul a, a while back. This is, I don't remember what dates on it, but uh, we found a lot of our customers were trying to get into, get more product reviews, essentially. They're trying to use Feedback Genius to get product reviews, which is a natural natural reason to use it. Yeah. But we still found even on best case, people get maybe 10% of the people that buy their products leave a product review. and Probably leave, less, yeah. But, yeah, in most cases, it's much less. 10% is very high. Um, so we started brainstorming, like, how do we get more product reviews? And that's when we sort of came up mm. with this genesis of the idea of Snagshout, was, uh, giving products away for a discount in exchange for a product review, um, and how sort of how that whole thing evolved. Um, and so Paul started on that really, I think it was probably around January 2014, he started working on that right. with a couple of people, and it really took us most of that year in order to get a product that uh, that worked. Um, started doing it probably we're very part time at the first of the year. But by December, I think we had something we were ready to release, and then we started using that internally with a, a few of our our uh, you know friends and family type of stuff, people we knew really closely to start using that, and formally launched that in January this year. Okay. So, so with Snagshout, um, what did you want it to do originally? And obviously, as you get feedback, what has changed? and improved so i guess initially it was all about uh um amazon reviews like trying to get amazon reviews uh, we found it's a very it's a very compelling uh product because of the sales velocity you get and the product reviews it's it's a yeah. uh, you kind of get the two two for one there you get sales velocity on amazon which helps you sell more and yeah. you get product reviews which helps your conversion rate yeah social proof aspect of it mm-hmm so we kind of started with that, and it's really taken off to be much bigger than just Amazon, too. So a lot of the stuff we're developing now is to do uh, to, to start marketing your product and your brand uh, on social media and throughout a lot of that. There's there's still a lot of ways we still can go to change how we want Snagshot to work and how exa what exactly we want it to be in the future. So yeah. there's we're still we, we've got a pretty good uh, roadmap on where we want to go in the near future, but the, the long term, st we've still a lot of different things we can do there. Yeah, what I like looking at the software is obviously when you create it, you're filling your own need and a lot of customers need. And so it makes me think of exactly what people should be doing for their business, right? That's important. One, they should be communicating with their customers. Hence, you created Feedback Genius and, and also getting reviews. Um, and kind of amplifying that with Snagshout. Um, so how are people using Snagshout? Just give, uh, maybe explain it a little bit, because I've, I've browsed a little bit, so I know, but just for people listening. Well, I mean, the, the, the obvious use case, I guess, for it is for people who are launching brand new products. So there's a big mm -hmm. trend right now of people doing, starting their own brands, taking a product and making it their own. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's, it's, it does very well for um, just trying to get like a product off the ground from having zero reviews to having yeah. your initial product reviews yeah. to, to seem relevant with your mm. competition. Yeah. Um, so it's very does very well for that. There's also another use case that's a little less obvious, I guess, that's in trying to take a product that's already being sold on Amazon and sell it more, or to um, to to use uh, Snagshot. The sales velocity you get from Amazon helps you to rank better in Amazon search. Mm -hmm. um, so Amazon naturally wants to show things that are that are the most that the customer is most likely to buy, and one of the Amazon's best signals for whether something that somebody's willing to buy something is how many have sold in the past, and especially in the recent past. Mm. Uh, and so the sales velocity you get from using uh, by having a campaign on Snagshot helps your product to rank better. Um, so that's a, that's a fairly te temporary type of thing in a lot of cases. If, you, if you're if you not selling very many and you do a large campaign, that's going to give you a bump for just a very short period of time. But if you use that on a longer term, it helps as well. Like a consistent and, basis, you mean? On a consistent basis, yeah. So, I mean, we can... And that comes into a little bit of why we've done done so much work on scope as well, is trying to see um, it's all about like how you rank in comparison to what you know, the competitive products. So if you're selling a product and there's three or four competitors that are very uh, similar uh, or very likely to buy, like it's mm -hmm. important to know how many products your your competition is selling so yeah. that you can sell an equal amount that's a rank equivalent or similar to yeah. Amazon. So right. That's a lot of that's a lot of the stuff we're trying to build into scope to help you sort of decide uh, how much you should use Snagshot, for instance. Yeah. So is there a best practice with Snagshot? Like, let's say I have a, you know, uh, a shampoo, like a natural shampoo or something. Like, I'd go on Snagshot, and what would I do? Uh, so as a seller, you would go on there. You can you'd sign up. If you haven't already got an account, it's pretty simple to create an account, sign up, uh, put in an email address and password. Um, and I think we have to put, have to put in a credit card number before you can create your first campaign. Yeah, because there's different uh, tiers, right? Or at least I was looking at it. For pricing? Yeah, like is that like the snags, the the amount um, of product? It's all about how many uh, how many Unit. products you have snagged. So the more you this the more snags you have, the the less it costs. So so if I like wanted to release, let's say a hundred units of the shampoo, that would be a hundred snags. 100 right. snags. If, if we only charge you when somebody actually snags it, so the, the billing is done. Uh, what do they call it? In retrospect or whatever, after the fact. Mm -hmm. so we don't charge you up front. We just charge you for the products we're able to give away. Uh, now it's important to note on Snagshot, like we can't guarantee that all your products are going to get given. All your products are going to get snagged, right? Right. So uh, the snaggers on the the users and the buyers on on Snagshot have a choice on what they want to buy. Right. Um, in a lot of cases, you don't have to get the product away. In, in most cases, we're trying to get people to actually sell the product at a discount, but not at a huge, steep discount. I see. So they're um, not giving away the product necessarily, although obviously if they did, they'd probably get more snags that, that's and where, more That's reviews. where it comes down. Like if, if you're selling a product that's normally uh, $20 and there's a, and there's 400 other those, of those on Amazon, we see that a lot with vitamin supplements and things. Like a lot of people are doing vitamin supplements. So in order to have a successful campaign with those on Snagshot, you practically have to give them away because everybody else, there's so many other choices there. Right. Where if you have a, a, a product that's very differentiated and, and has a, it's all about the perceived value. So if, if the price on it is normally $50 um, and you can do it for $30 on Snagshot, yeah. you might be losing money, you might be breaking even at that price. But if there's a $20 perceived value they're getting from Snagshot, you're going to be more likely to sell it than if you only had a $5 discount or something. I see. I see. So best practices when getting reviews, like just try and discount it as much as humanly possible if, if that's the actual depends, like, end depends goal. On want, depends on how many you want, to, you want to promote also. So if your goal is to give away five a day, you don't have to have a huge discount. But if your goal is to give away 100 a day, you need, you need to have a steeper discount on that. So you're saying with Snagshot, it's more on a consistent basis where you see people kind of flood it at a one-time thing. Snagshot, people, you want more of a consistency, a consistent amount of sales over a period of time because that looks more natural. It's really both. It depends yeah. on what you, what you need. So, <coughs> excuse me. It's, it obviously works well for product launches that uh, require some. Maybe you give away fifty or twenty-five, whatever that is, to make you relevant in your in your for your product. So right. if all your competitors have 700 reviews, you're probably going to need to do some more giveaways or discounted products in yeah. order to get closer to 700 reviews, where if all yeah. your competitors have 15 or 20 reviews, you don't need to do as many. Yeah. 
it's all, it's really about uh, how how you rank and, and how how you fit in with the the competitive products that are there. Yeah. So, so Brandon, what else have you seen where you know will help people sell more? Obviously, getting more reviews. Um, you you have a couple posts on the death of super URLs. Do you want to talk oh, about that? That's that's a hot tire. It was a hot topic months ago, I guess. So it, 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 it's a people are still probably using them. People are so. It, let's see how complicated and technical do we want to get real quickly? As here? complicated as you think needs to be. All right. So yeah. I would describe a super URL does not begin with www.amazon.com. That's a, a common misconception. So. A super URL begins with a URL that starts with some kind of link shortener or whatever. Mm. Uh, and then as what happens is the super URL service will take a short link and it'll expand it out to an Amazon link that begins with www.amazon.com. And in part of that URL, it manipulates certain parts of that the, the, the parameters in that URL to make it look as though the shopper just searched for something on Amazon when in fact they did not. Mm. Um, so that's the part that's a little deceptive about it, which we think is not good. And Amazon will is easy to it's easier for them to catch on to. So can people use a cert like if they search on Amazon, let's say shampoo, and they grab that URL or the, and they click on their link from Amazon and grab that URL? That's an Amazon.com with that the search by keyword shampoo. Yep. Is that okay to use for people? Or? Certain, that's, that's the way people have been doing it for many years, and I would say there's no reason to think that that would be a problem. So the problem is if someone uses some kind of shortener that then manipulates, yeah, manipulates the pro- it. The problem is the shortener that then changes those parameters every time somebody clicks on it. It mm. generates a different URL um, to make it look as though there was multiple searches that occurred, even though yeah. nobody can actually search for it. Yeah. So I that see. part is manipulative. I think it's clearly manipulative when we talk about it sort of in this context of like we're changing these parameters to make it look like a search actually occurred. The intent there is certainly to manipulate Amazon's algorithm. I see. Whether that actually still works or not, some people say it does, some people say it doesn't. We say it's it, it's it's certainly an intent to manipulate. Right. Why even your your articles like why even risk it if you can get banned? Like why even risk it? Like most of these right. most most of our customers have a large percentage of their sales on Amazon. Um, and if your Amazon's account gets suspended even for a few hours, let alone days or weeks that it sometimes takes, it's, uh, it's a huge it's blow. detrimental to your business, right? Yeah, so huge blow. Why, why risk it yeah. uh, for something that may or may not work? Yeah. So what else should people be thinking when they want to boost sales? So reviews, obviously keeping in touch with customers with, with specific emails. What else? Like I like to say there's no magic bullet, but I, if, I, if there was one magic bullet, I would say... You're like, it's it is, scope. No, I'm just it is kidding. Have a great product. Yeah. That's the best thing you can do to have sales on Amazon is yeah. have a great product, right? So if yeah. you can have a product that's fabulous, you'll sell more. And it's <laughs> value. That's good advice. Um, good. We often forget about that. Um, so scope. What is scope? Uh, you're in beta now. Um, maybe when this releases, it's going to be out of beta. So yeah, what did you create in scope? So what we're done with Scope is we, we had a product called SearchRank that was a while back that we haven't we had some initial people sign up for it we kind of pulled back on it because it did this one of the one of the features in it was this uh, super URL building type of thing yeah um, but at its core like the real functionality that we liked out of it was this ability to watch uh, where your product ranked on Amazon Search and so mm-hmm. uh, while we don't want to we don't um, we want to pull that functionality into Scope. So Scope is all about, uh, the name of it really came from thinking of like a microscope or a telescope, like you're trying to look into and see details about how something works on the inside of it sort of, and trying to analyze that. And so the, the idea of the name, but the name Scope is supposed to be for you to sort of like look inside of a product and figure out what makes it tick and all the different components about how, it's, how it works and what makes it successful. And so we're trying to build a lot of that data into Scope. So we're, we're doing a lot of things to try and pull data from Amazon's catalog, from Amazon's search results, um, from uh, all these different sort of data points we have to help you understand uh, what people are looking for when they search and buy your products, and then how you how your product uh, compares to other competitors, to competitors' products, and then to give you ideas on... So it's used, I guess, for to look at the products you're, you're already selling and then see how you compete there, and then also to give you some idea of products you're not selling yet that you're maybe considering mm. uh, bringing to market or, or sourcing. Yeah, uh, which is really idea. important. Yeah, give you some idea of what, they expect, what you can expect out of it. Like if 
just using uh, Amazon data, you don't know if you, if I should buy 20 of these or should I buy 200 of them. It's a, it's a common question. Like if I buy X number of them, how many is it going to last? How long is it going to last me? I'm trying to get answered some of those questions about uh, some of these data that's sort of hidden in Amazon. Right, so some of the some of the some of the uh, yeah some of the information that you should be able to get at Amazon catalog that you can't. Um, so we're trying to make that a little more surface that a little easier. Yeah, yeah I mean. Th- this sounds like a complicated task. And how do you do a, what's the best way to do a UI for something like this? Like, what do you find that people, that sellers are looking for? What's most important to them when they look at that? Let's say they get in their scope platform area. What are they looking for? What do they want to see? Uh, so a lot of times, uh, a lot of times people approach it from what am I selling right now? And how does it do? How does it work in comparison? Or, yeah. or how, is it, how, what's the performance of it this week versus last week? Yeah. So trying to look at and pull in some of that data that we had as far as tracking your position in search. Uh, so maybe if I'm selling an apple slicer, um, like I was ranked number four this week and now I'm ranked number three, hopefully that equates to some boost in sales. Yeah. And then also tying that back to like, okay, if I was ranked four last week and I'm ranked three this week, what did I do right. to, to do that? So how do I keep doing that? How do I repeat right. that? It's hard to track that, yeah. There's, there's all these different variables that are going on at any given time, so it is kind of hard to say, you know, is it just because apple slicers are busier this week because it's a holiday or it's a different season? Right. Or did, there, did I do something with my listing or did my competition's price go up? Like, what changed for me to rank better? So trying to right. nail down some of that data to get you vis- visibility into what might have happened there. So have you heard anything, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, Brandon, but um, from people using Scope and the beta, what ideas have people gotten? Or generated because of using it. Um, I don't know. We, I'm, I'm actually not so directly involved with scope, so it's yeah. a little hard for me to answer some of that. I, um, what ideas have people gotten? Yeah, because I could see people, the people like e-commerce people I've, you know, talked to, spend a lot of time on new ideas. You know, they want to expand their catalog, they want to expand their SKUs, and they're constantly thinking about what else should I be getting. Yeah, so I guess one of the really cool things we have in there is a, uh, and this operates sort of independent of Amazon's suggestions and stuff, but we have the yeah. ability to look at similar products. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you're looking at a specific product, a little bar on the right shows mm. similar products that yeah. might be either people that bought this, bought that. Also, it might be tie-ins that way. It might be competitive products. So you get some idea of like what might be, uh, what what people might be seeing that you might not normally consider. Yeah. Maybe that's in products. If, if you're if you're really big in a niche in a specific category or a particular um, like a little facet of some some brand, maybe there's some similar products there that you might be able to source or uh, manufacture. Right. Um, the other one would be um, like sometimes there are different keywords that you don't realize. Maybe these maybe maybe I'm selling a product that search that sells because I have this really obscure keyword I didn't realize. Right. That people are actually searching for blue toenail clippers and they're buying my product even though I didn't know that that was a major thing that people were searching for. I'm trying, right. to, trying to surface some of that information and say, oh, you're actually getting a significant portion of sales because of this term you didn't realize. Yeah. And so maybe that, maybe you market that product differently or cre- create a new product based on that knowledge. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. What's also interesting about, you know, software creators for e-commerce like yourself is you t- you can step back and kind of see the the whole scope of everything. And so I'm wondering, but you know, we talked about the feedback genius. What mistakes people make? What what do you see mistakes people making in e-commerce in general that's that's hindering them? Um, well, I mentioned earlier, like there's a, there's a lot of people trying to do this private label thing and sell like products that they make themselves. I think a lot of times people underestimate um, how much work that is yeah. and how how much money it takes. Specifically, yeah. it's, it's fairly capital intensive. Yeah. What have you seen? Yeah. I would say, and it depends on the product, it depends on all the, but I mean, it takes ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to try and launch a product, to try and get the product here, manufactured how you want it to, to be able to promote it right and to get it selling. It's, it's, it, you can't, you can try and cut some corners there, but it gets, you got to do a lot more stuff yourself or it takes a lot longer sometimes. Yeah. So, so a big mistake, people kind of, they think they're going to get rich and just put this, get, put this private label together and, and it takes a lot more time, energy and money. So what you're saying? Yeah, I, th- I think a lot of times it does. It's it, it's more. Yeah. Sometimes they have uh, high expectations, and mm-hmm. um, without doing all the stuff, like without, it takes more money a lot of times than what people need. So. Yeah, yeah. Right. 
So what else? What other big mistakes do you see? Big mistakes. Sellers, huh? yeah. A lot of times I think people have a lot of products. So a lot of times uh, yeah. people try to get a lot of products, and a lot of those products aren't actually making them any money. Right. So I think that's another big thing. Yeah. Not necessarily a huge thing, but uh, something I think I see a yeah. fair amount of time. People might yeah. have 500 SKUs, but there's only 20 of them that matter to their business. Mm. Those are the ones that they're selling the most of. Mm -hmm. All this other stuff, if they were to actually maybe take a step back and look at it and say, if I actually – ditched all these and didn't have to spend the time yeah. and money and have the money tied up in capital and in, uh, inventory, I'm able to use that better in a different manner yeah. um, for products that actually are working. Yeah. I'm just really curious because I know you'll see all the sellers and I'm just wondering which ones you're shaking your head at and you're like, no, they are not doing the right thing here. What, what are some other things you shake your head at when you look at some of the people using your platform? Um, I guess one of the other things I think see a lot of is people um, not differentiating their products a lot. So mm -hmm. if, if you're uh, again like private label trying to trying to market your own brand, like if you don't have something differentiating your product significantly, it's it's like yeah. it's hard to differentiate and make your product stand out if there's not um, something compelling about it that's yeah. different from competitors. And sometimes uh, what a lot of people end up doing is like differentiating based on price. So making your product cheaper, which doesn't horrible, yeah. <laughs> kind of answer that's not where you wanted to go with it but a yeah. lot of times you do that to be, to be competitive yeah so find something to, to differentiate your product and a lot of times that in, that requires more than just putting a label on it that's the same product that everybody else can get you have to actually do work and do some innovation to make something different or something that new that hasn't been done before mm -hmm. that's great yeah i constantly think of the usp the unique selling proposition is huge yeah oftentimes we don't think of that all the time yeah, like what are you doing to drive value? Like uh, you, that, that people buy stuff because it's valuable for them. So right. what do you do to add value to either the product or the supply chain or something like that? Um, and a lot of times, like the value that people add is not much more than just some capital to buy a product and make it available at a convenient time. Yeah. Um, and if that's the value you're adding, you need to understand the economics of that. It has to be a high volume business in order to do that because yeah. uh, the you're, it, just, it depends on what your business model is. Some people prefer yeah. the high volume, low margin type of stuff like that. And some people would prefer to put the extra effort into specific products and and yeah. the extra marketing and stuff to have a higher margin. So, yeah. What were some of the big mistakes you made when you were selling the books or buying those pallets? We definitely underestimated how uh, resource intensive it was as far as labor. So Labor wise? Labor wise. We, we, fair, we feel like we had a fairly good amount of automation in there, mm -hmm. um, but it still required a lot of labor. Like labor was almost as expensive as the product when we really? were doing it. Wow. Uh, depending on you know, what you're doing, but yeah, there was a lot of labor involved. Uh, and some of that is just hard to avoid. So mm -hmm. that's, that's that's the main thing I think I've, I learned out of running some of the stuff was the, the, the labor requirements uh, just to, yeah. to do stuff. It takes people and, and uh, people are relatively expensive. So. To, to hire somebody and to pay their benefits and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. What other challenges did you face with the e-commerce side, with the books and selling? Um, so, I, so we didn't know anything about running a warehouse and doing all that kind of stuff. So we basically did all that stuff from scratch. We, right. we, we didn't uh, like we tried to do stuff very economically. So we were building our own shelves out of we're buying two by fours and plywood and building. I'm our surprised own you still have hair in your head. I'd be pulling. I would have pulled I, it all out. We had a few other guys that were good with a hammer and the yeah. drill, but um, what would you have done now if you do it over? Oh, I don't know. I I I, uh, I had a good time doing it. It was always fun, so I can't say there was anything bad about that. But yeah. uh, we probably did that longer than we should have. We should have uh, got out, gotten out of it a little bit quicker and adjusted over to software quicker. Yeah. So. What's been the biggest challenge on the software side of things? Um, I would say like, uh, probably it has to do with, again, the people like trying to get, trying to develop a team and trying to get the group of people, mm. uh, a body of knowledge, not just one person. So yeah. a lot of the stuff, a lot of the original feedback genius product that I, I wrote myself and I was the main guy in charge of that. So, uh, when we've developed these other software projects, we've been able to do that, um, with a team of people that's worked yeah. out much better. And now trying to take feedback genius off my hands and go back and make get people involved in that is a little more difficult. Um, so just trying to get that um, get that knowledge out there so that other people in the company can support it. So that I'm, not, I'm not the only one that has to do everything yeah. on the on the very technical stuff. So that mm -hmm. people understand it, can maintain it, 
can make improvements to it uh, and support it and all that kind of stuff is uh, it takes a lot of good people in order to do that. And we've done we've done a fair amount of work with trying to make sure we're hiring the right people. Yeah. Good people that want to work here that have a good understanding of the industry. Yeah. And that are very skilled. And we're very, very proud of the team we have that's pulled together to do all that. So, yeah, I'd work there. I saw one of your uh, videos and it showed a lot of good food. And I'm like, stuff. food is definitely a big part of our, of our culture. I was like, I'm going to drive, I'm going to come down to Atlanta and work there. Cause I just saw the delicious food on the, on the video. Like yeah. sign me up. We have uh, lunch provided every Friday and pretty good snacks here the rest of the time. So, and then we do, we do stuff fairly often. So, so tell me about this. Cause I think this is an important point, Brandon, about the team. Right. And it's not like you're just one or two people. Like you guys have, I think I counted, there's like 10 10 uh, different developers alone? I would say we're probably up to 15 or something 15. now. 15, so. wow. Yeah, so tell me about, because this is a real development software company. How do you uh, run the meetings and how do you get everyone on the same page when it comes to this? Uh, so we, we try to divide things into separate projects. Um, so we have essentially a feedback genius scope and uh, snagshot teams yeah. as well as a new product. Um, you know, we try to guide those with a product manager that's in charge of the products yeah. and then the developers that all sort of work on the products and the features we're working for mm -hmm. towards. Is it and like a it, scrum, like a scrum methodology type of? Yeah, we, I mean, we do the daily standups. We do try to create sprints of the features yeah. you want to work on. If you're familiar with software development, yeah. scrum is... Yeah, tell people about it a little bit because I think people can use this to manage many different things and I found it fascinating. So it is, I guess it is a little bit interesting. I don't know that we yeah. do it all 100%. I don't know if there is a right way of doing yeah, this. Yeah, right. Um, but in general, the software development, the agile software development mentality is yeah. to have a develop, we have daily, daily, we call them stand-up meetings. They're intended to be short meetings. They call them stand-up meetings because they're only supposed to be five to 10 minutes long. Right. Uh, in the stand-up meeting, you're supposed to tell everybody in the group that's working on the project and the, the team should probably be no more than five to maybe seven people. Mm-hmm. Um, the team should uh, each day in their stand-up meeting um, talk about what they're working on yesterday, yeah. what they did yesterday, what they plan to work on today, and yeah. then uh, any blockers if they're waiting for somebody else for to complete something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That way the team sort of knows what's going on in five or ten minutes each day. They got some idea what everybody else is doing and where they fit into the picture. And then sort of once a week we have a longer meeting, a longer version of one of those where we kind of sit down and look at like what do we want to accomplish this week and what do we – is this a realistic plan for what we can accomplish this week? Yeah. Uh, and then probably every, every other week or so we have more maybe a longer term one to figure out like where do we want to be next month from now? Like what do we want to have to do? What do we need to plan for and have prepared so that we can – don't have to wait on it when, it's, when we're actually actively working on a project. Yeah, so. yeah. I find it very valuable, even like talking to some software developers, and I, you know, listen to audio or Audible, the Scrum or whatever it is, by uh, the founder Sutherland. Um, and so I do have a Trello board with, you know, to do, doing, and then done. And I do the use the Fibonacci sequence and everything. Do you guys do that like really technical? No, I don't know the Fibonacci thing. But oh, okay. Basically, they call it a work board, a Scrum board. Yeah, exactly, board. exactly. Yeah. This is the this is the sprint that we're on right now, and these yes. are the tasks that we want to accomplish in this sprint. Yes. And the sprint's going to be done by this date, and we just all work until we get that that done by that date as much as we can. Yeah, yeah. Um, Do you find with the developers you have on, are they on board with this? Are there objections about I have to have a daily meeting? This seems crazy. Like, what are the, some of the objections you get? We get, uh, like I said, we I guess we hire good people because yeah. uh, we don't have a lot of objections to it. A lot of times, I, I guess our biggest uh, complication with that is a lot of times people aren't in the office. Mm. So we're working remotely. Yeah, we 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 have essentially a, a results only work environment mm. for, for the most part. So people might be uh, calling in or call, like sometimes this happen with Google Hangouts. Sometimes they happen just on our Slack communication channel. Um, depending on the size of the team, if the team's only got two people on it, they might be able to just coordinate on Slack with a couple of messages back and forth. Um, and then larger teams have like a, a like a Google Hangout every day or whatever. So yeah. different teams do it in different ways, but the, the, the result is to just kind of get on the same page and make sure you're working towards the same goal. Yeah. So Brandon, what other big trends are you seeing? I know you are you have a strong opinion about the super URLs. What else do you have a strong opinion on? in e-commerce that people should or should not be doing? Oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, find, 
<laughs> Strong opinions. Um, I don't know if I got a great answer to that one. Like, you know, I was just looking at your blog post. There's like two. I figured you have a strong opinion because you wrote two blog posts on super URLs. Um, and the rest are fairly technical about Amazon WS permissions. And um, yeah, I guess I can go down that road a little bit. So I feel like uh, on, on the technical side, I'm obviously a fairly technical person. Yeah. On the technical side, um, Amazon's MWS is their the name of their API. They use the, a program we would use to communicate with your Amazon seller account. Yeah. Um, and what, I actually put a, put out a petition six months or a year ago or whatever to try and get Amazon to uh, list those permissions that people list the companies to which sellers had granted access to their accounts mm. uh, inside Amazon. Because up until that point, a user might have subscribed to listing service A or repricing service B or whatever. And then stopped using the service, but they never had any way to take away the permissions. I the see. Company. Yeah. The company still had permissions a year later, two years later. And so if that company got hacked or had internal problems or whatever, yeah. like you still could be affected by that. Oh, yeah. Good so point. I felt like I, I put a blog post and petition out about that a while back. And that actually feature was released by Amazon earlier this year, probably two or three months ago. Wow. They have the ability now to go into your Seller Central account and go down to the user permissions, and you can see who you've granted access to, mm. and revoke access to that if you want. So that's been a big deal. I really like for Amazon to make that more granular permissions. So uh, as a as a software developer, when you grant access to any third party access to your MWS account, yeah, um, they have access to do everything. You can't limit what the access is really to, to create listings, to vol- pull in reports. Hmm. The change prices, I'd like that to be much more granular permissions that you could say, I'm subscribing to repricing service and they have permission to change my prices, but nothing else. Or I'm subscribing to Feedback Genius and they have permissions to pull in my orders, but not change my prices. Like there's, that doesn't exist right now. Right. And so the seller really has to rely on the, on the software developer, the third party. You have to, to trust them. You have to trust them. No, they're yeah. going the right way. So, so I think, I think that uh, the seller should be able to limit that a lot more on Amazon. Yeah. Be a better platform if if the, if that uh, the, they could grant more granular permissions. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a good reason you're doing the interview because people see your face and they trust you after hearing you. And if they don't trust you after this interview, they should go to your blog. Uh, this this blog. I don't know. I'm assuming this is you. It's the Brandon Checkett's blog. And yeah, the reason funny. they should trust you because I don't understand one word of one of the titles because it's so technical. It's like it's like DKIM SPF spam assassin test move to DKM validator.com. So that's a, that's a tool that you might use to check if, uh, <laughs> if your emails pass some spam checking. Right. Stuff. I'm just saying, you Hold know, very, you. whoever, this is the founder you're dealing with very technical people. Um, so on that side of things, Brendan, what types of software do you think are essential for people to use in their business, e-commerce business? Obviously, you know, seller labs software, um, yes. you know, we feedback genius, snag shout software. scope. What else out there should people be thinking about? Uh, it depends on your business model. Uh, so if you're, like I said, if you're doing a, a, a business where you've got a lot of SKUs, you certainly need some sort of inventory management software. Yeah. Uh, if you're doing a business where you've only got one or two SKUs, you could probably get by without an inventory management software and you're probably looking more at marketing type of software. Yeah. Or analytics type of software. So mm-hmm. it depends on where you want to go with it. Um, we like to describe um, businesses have. We, we kind of like to just break down businesses based on how they source products. Yeah. Uh, and this might go really long. I have no idea. But so uh, there's we kind of describe four different ways of sourcing product. One of them would be sort of a um, uh, we call it a scouter sort of product. Mm-hmm. So you might find deals either in person from uh, arbitrage opportunities at retail stores or yeah. online. Yeah. Sort of scouting for one-off deals, trying to find good deals to buy and resell. So that's certainly one po- very popular way of buying and reselling products. Right. The next one past that would be sort of uh, wholesale relationships with buyers mm-hmm. or with product manufacturers or yeah. distributors. Yeah. Um, so, but the the skills and the, and the the business operations change very drastically. If if you're doing these uh, sort of scouting business model, all of your time and energy is should be towards optimizing how much, how efficient am I when I'm scouting and trying to find opportunities, right? Right. So you want to be as efficient as possible as that because usually time is your limiting factor. Right. If you now take a step over to this business model where you have wholesale relationships with people and you're ordering maybe hundreds of products at a time, then 
a lot of times your limiting factor in that case is more capital intensive. Like mm. how do I best deploy my capital? Yeah. If I've got the choice of all these 400 different products, how do I buy the right combination of products that gives me the best return on my capital investment? Yes, yes. Um, so that's another one. The other one we talk about a lot of times is like a liquidation business model, which we actually have a fair amount of experience in that. Where yes. I'm just going to buy a trailer of stuff. I don't know what's on it, but now i got to figure out how to process that and list it in the right way and try yeah. to make the most amount of money on that. Yeah. And so that's one that we personally have found is very, like we talked about, labor intensive. Like how do I go through this um, – pallet or trailer load of stuff mm -hmm. in an efficient manner to try and get it to try and go through it to weed out the stuff that should be garbage put that in the trash find the stuff that should be sold and make sure you, you created a good listing mm -hmm. without spending way too much time creating the listing like how do i optimize my time in that case and then there's some capital and uh some capital component to that how do i make sure that i uh, get a return on that investment in a reasonable time frame yeah and then the fourth sort of model for source inventory becomes this manufacturing and labeling and creating your own product. Like, mm -hmm. And then that one is very much more like how do I market my product correctly? How do I create the right copy and the right packaging and all this sort of stuff? Like how do I make my product stand out? Yeah, That's another completely like different business model that you just have different tactics and things on. So yeah. Yeah. we kind of divide the world into those sort of four sourcing methods and the tools you and the tools and the the way you think about the world kind of depends on which one of those you kind of fall into. And yeah. a lot of people have a combination of several. Yeah. yeah. So, Brian, I'm going to take a second and uh, give a quick plug for the sponsor. And because um, we're talking a lot about software, obviously. So, I always say to people imagine if you could combine all the software to tools you currently use to run your e commerce business besides Seller Labs into one centralized cloud platform for a fraction of the cost. Would you use it? Of course you would. Now, Skubana does all of that. I personally use them, actually. What I love most about them is sort of what you mentioned, Brandon, which is let's say you have like a certain 10 or 20 SKUs and you know exactly which ones are profitable and which ones are not profitable. Well, you should probably just stop selling the ones that are not profitable. So they actually have that feature, which I can search my profitable SKUs and not profitable SKUs and start eliminating those. Um, as well as obviously you talked about the inventory management, which is hard to uh, hard problem to tackle, which they've done. Um, so Brent, I appreciate your time. And I have one last question for you. And people should just check out sellerlabs.com. You know, there's you know a wealth of information on your blog, um, and then sellerlabs.com backslash apps, which has the feedback genius snapshot and scope. Um, my last question is about your daily rituals. Now you run multiple companies, Round Sphere, which I didn't mention, Seller Labs. You know, I talk about you know we already talked about um, you know Book Scouter. And you run, you've run several marathons, half marathons. We didn't talk about you have a wife and four kids, right? That's right. So how do you manage all this? What does your daily routine look like? Oh, I would say that there's not, not like a specific, like I, I, sometimes it would be nice to have like a specific, I wake up at this time and I go to work at this time. Like and a lot of that time, a lot of that stuff is very much in flux because of all the stuff we've got going on. But yeah. I generally try to like, I mean, I, I would say generally, uh, when the kids are in school, I try to wake up like at 6.30, 7.30, get them off to school. Uh, during the summer, I like to go for a run in the morning. During the winter, it's a little harder. The run has to be sort of in the evening when it's uh, a little warmer out. Um, go to work for a good chunk of the day in the middle. Uh, meet a lot of my days uh, with meetings with other people, trying to make sure we've got everybody doing the right things and on, on the, all the all the businessy stuff is going on as it should. And I take off usually each day about 4 45 or so so i can get home at five and go spend the evening with the family and have dinner and all that stuff yeah. so any certain things you use in your daily activity like tools or apps or something that makes you extra productive or efficient um you know i don't know if there's anything fantastic uh, i'm a big fan of slack i guess if you've never used slack before for communication within the office that's very useful and cuts mm -hmm. down a number of emails going back and forth and mm -hmm. kind of consolidates information there um mm. I'm still searching for the perfect uh, uh, email slash to-do list slash uh, life planning calendar. <laughs> I haven't found that yet. You seem to be doing pretty well overall. You know, Brandon, this has been hugely valuable. I really appreciate your time. People should check out sellerlabs.com. Thanks again, Brandon. Thanks again, Jeremy. Have a good night. You too.